What's up YouTube? So today I want to talk about your first steps into the digital audio workstation domain. So this video is kind of aimed at the DJs who are stepping into wanting to produce music for the first time. I had an interesting question from one of my newer Patreons in my Inner Circle Discord group thing. If you want to know more about that, there's links in the description. Anyway, I don't want to blabber too much. Um, I had an interesting question. He is a DJ who's been mixing tracks for um, several years, but wanting to kind of start adding his own live elements to tracks. And I think specifically in dance music, this is a very common thing. DJs wanting to get into producing their own tracks. And this is kind of how a lot of us kind of start exploring music production for the first time. So that's not always the case, but I just find it's quite prevalent in dance music specifically. So I thought this would be a very interesting video to make, you know, going coming from the world of DJing where you kind of know a little bit about mixing and volumes and that kind of thing and learning how to add your own elements on top of tracks and slowly start to build up enough kind of sound design knowledge to be able to produce your own tracks on top of that. A couple of the questions came up from my Patreon, but another couple of questions have been coming up and I think it's pretty interesting because a lot of this stuff, I think myself, I take for granted because it's information that I kind of have just known for so long. But a lot of these questions deal with very basic questions about how to move around a DAW and that kind of thing. So I think it's very important for everybody to know. So even if you're not coming from a DJ background and you're just starting music production for the first time, hopefully this video will be helpful for you. So I've chosen to do this video in Bitwig, which is probably the closest to Ableton, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are using. I personally just prefer Bitwig for several reasons, which I'm not really going to get into. I think those reasons are kind of negligible for, you know, beginners and that kind of thing. So a lot of the ideas that I'm going to be explaining can be put to use in almost any DAW, whether it's Fruity Loops, Cubase, Ableton, Reason, um, or Bitwig, as I'm going to be using today. Hopefully the ideas that I explained are kind of general and across the board. So anyway, without blabbering too much, let's dive into the video. So firstly, I want to deal with a couple of DAW housekeeping type of things. So I know that Ableton and Bitwig both have a kind of session view and an arrangement view. What that is, is the session view is basically like your mixer. This allows you to actually trigger different loops and samples and stuff. A lot of people who are DJing with Bitwig or Ableton use the session view to kind of launch different tracks and different clips. But for the purpose of this video, I think it's important that we use the arrangement view because this arrangement view is probably the closest that you're going to find to a lot of the other DAWs on the market. Personally, I prefer the kind of linear style of DAW where it allows you to kind of view your entire track and add pieces as you want. But some people prefer to sketch out ideas in the session view to build loops and arrangements and different kind of ideas and then start to piece those together in the arrangement view afterwards. That being said is knowing the kind of uh, pros and cons of both is just going to kind of make you more fluent in the DAW that you do choose. But like I said, a lot of DAWs don't actually have the session view. So I'm going to kind of stick to the arrangement view today. So one thing that's interesting about Bitwig, I don't think Ableton has this, is you can actually do the clip launching from the arrangement view, which is pretty interesting. So you can still sketch a lot of ideas and you know create loops and rhythms and stuff to add on top of your track without actually adding them to the track. You can kind of do it non-destructively, if that makes sense, without flipping between the two windows. So I think, you know, there's little things in Bitwig that I think just make it a slightly better option, but that's again, those little things are so negligible. I mean, the, the fact that you can, I guess, just tab between the two windows, it's such a small thing. You know, you can drag clips over from the one window to the other. A lot of the stuff that you can access, for example, like the mixer, which is on the session view, um, you'll see here, for example, we've got two channels. One represents an instrument channel and one represents an audio channel. I'm going to get into exactly what those are, but something interesting to note about Bitwig is it actually doesn't matter. They can both share different types of information. So for example, an instrument track can hold audio clips and vice versa. Um, it's kind of got this hybrid track technology going on, which I think is very interesting. Specifically, if you do a lot of rendering and chopping and that kind of thing, and your projects do become very busy, you know, with like lots of different tracks of different edits and different clips, you know, having this hybrid track can be really cool because you could have for example, a live MIDI pattern and then edits of the audio track all kind of bounced onto a single um, audio track and you can kind of always go back to the MIDI later. 
I think I'm getting a little bit too technical for the beginners. But anyway, for example, this mixer, you can turn this volume up here. Let's say, for example, turn it all the way up to the top. And if we jump to the arrangement view, you'll see that it's reflected that change on this volume over here. And you'll see like if we move the any of these parameters here, for example, it will be reflected both here on what's called the inspector on the left hand side, um, which shows you a lot of your parameters from the mixer. But it also gets reflected here on the mixer itself. So these two windows kind of coexist. It's kind of, I guess, behind the scenes, it's the same code and the same machinery and everything that's happening. You kind of have just have two different viewpoints of what's happening inside the machine. So I guess it's more about what you prefer to use. Anyway, that aside, let's start looking at the difference between audio tracks, instrument tracks, MIDI tracks, and that kind of thing. Traditionally, in older DAWs, you had to set up a MIDI channel, which you would program all of your notes and all of your music theory things, your uh, sequences and loops. And then you would have an actual, either an actual synth outside of the computer, or you would load up the plugin kind of separate from the channel. And you would send the MIDI information from the MIDI track to the channel. And it was a whole big nightmare set up and routing and all sorts of things. In recent years, things have become a lot easier. So they've kind of created the idea of an instrument channel where most of that routing is kind of done automatically. Just to make things easier for the explanation, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete all the channels. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add an audio track. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of things about importing loops into a project. So here I've actually got a finished track. This track has been, um, I've already finished mixing it, producing it, and it's already been mastered. It is from my upcoming progressive album. It's a little bit slower and groovier than my usual full on Cytron stuff. But there's a couple of things that we'll generally notice when importing or dragging and dropping loops into the project. So what's happened? It sounds a lot slower than it usually is, and it kind of has a weird, um, it, you know, it sounds different. It sounds lower in pitch. And that's because when you drag in a large audio file, it tries to warp the kicks or the main beats of the audio file to a tempo. So it kind of analyzes it, it picks up the tempo, and it warps it to whatever your project tempo is. So here by default, the Bitwig project tempos are 110 BPM. And this project, when I originally produced it, I believe I produced it at 128. Um, if you don't know what BPM is, it's beats per minute. That's the speed or the kind of tempo of your track. Also what happens is because I've set this over here to repitch mode, you've actually got several different types of modes. Um, I know Ableton also has several different modes. Raw will leave the, the audio absolutely untouched. However, we do actually want to sync this up to the grid. So what we can do is we can actually just set this over here to what we know the project tempo to be, which is 128 BPM. And then what will happen is because we use repitch mode, if it's at the tempo of the project tempo, there'll be no processing applied. So this should sound exactly as it was in the master. Okay, so here's another thing to note about the way that Bitwig handles uh, channels. By default, it turns the audio or the volume of your channel down by about halfway, which I think is pretty strange. Although that being said is I think it's a good practice. I think it's just strange because I'm not used to it. Generally speaking, when I load a track up into my DAWs, the first thing I do is I turn the volume down a little bit. And then what happens is your tracks start to fill up and you start to kind of get to the point where you know, you kind of have no more space to add more sounds. So you've got to kind of turn everything down a little bit more. So in terms of production, I think it's good practice that when you import tracks, they start at a lower volume because then that just gives you infinite headroom to work with, you know? At no point will you ever get to the point where you run out of space. Does that make sense? Um, that being said is when you're working with mastered material, you often want it to be at the volume that it's mastered at. Now let's look at an instrument channel, a device channel, or a MIDI channel. Let's, like I said, we're gonna kind of treat them all as a single kind of idea. 
So in Bitwig, you have got several built-in devices. Most EAWs come with built-in devices, um, like synths and that kind of thing. What I want to do, just for the purpose of this quick explanation, I'm going to add in one of uh, Bitwig's built-in devices over here, just to get some sound going. You don't necessarily need a MIDI controller for this, but it does help to be able to just play notes. Um, I will show you though how you can play notes off just your computer keyboard. So if you hit caps lock, it gives you the ability to actually audition notes on your QWERTY keyboard, where A would be the note C, S would be the note D, D would be the note E, etc, etc. So that, like I said, this is very handy if you don't have a MIDI controller and you want to audition to hear what a sound sounds like alongside your track. Instrument tracks are like little synthesizers inside your computer. They allow you to play little melodies and stuff or to create any types of sound that you want to add on top of uh, the track that you're creating. You could potentially synthesize your own drum sounds. It's, it's limitless, potentially limitless what you can create with synthesizers. But getting back to the point here of the video is that you're not just limited to the synthesizer. You've got all sorts of audio effects and things that are built in as well. Um, let's say, for example, some of my favorites are delay and a reverb. So these are all quite common. Um, and the, the devices that I'm using here are all built into Bitwig. So like I said, you can play around forever and it's really, really fun to just explore the world of synthesis and just, you know, play with sounds and create all sorts of different weird textures and stuff like that and start to build up a library of presets. So what a preset is, is it's basically a little template, something that you've saved within a device that you can call up at a later stage. So note here that to get this particular sound, we needed four devices. So we've got FM4, which is a built-in Bitwig thing that creates the actual tone. Then we've got a filter that kind of we're using to move the tone around in the sound spectrum. And then we've got the delay, which kind of acts as an echo effect. And then the reverb, which kind of just creates some extra room to the sound. I guess it, it depends what kind of workflow you prefer. Having it like this is kind of nice because it's very modular. Although that being said, it is for saving presets and that kind of thing. This is a little bit of a pain in the ass because you need to load four different devices and then all sorts of things. So you could potentially put all of these into a single device and then save it. But that brings me to my next point, a thing called VSTs. So VST is basically like an external uh, synth that you can install into your DAW. It doesn't potentially come with, for example, it doesn't come with Ableton or doesn't come with Bitwig or doesn't come with Cubase. But you can either buy it or there's a lot of really good free stuff. And a lot of them have the oscillators which create the tones, the filters to shape the tones, and all the effects and everything kind of built in. And then you can create these really vast presets with, uh, which are kind of like full sounds pre-baked in one. So my favorite example of this is Vital because they have a free version which is still fully featured. There's just a couple of extra things that you get with a paid version like text-to-speech and extra wavetables and that kind of thing. Well, the features that you get, Vital is definitely the one to go for. Obviously, there's other personal favorites and other things that people enjoy using. Serum is a good option. Faceplant is a good option. Yuhi's Hive 2 is another good option. There's several good options. Arturia's Pigments, very good option. That being said, Vital is free. So you guys should definitely go and grab it. And the reason I like it is A, because it's got all of this stuff built in. You can create those presets and stuff, but it's also incredibly visual. So for learning how these things work, for learning how sound synthesis works, it's a really, really great tool. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove, the, remove that instrument track. 
and uh, we can look at how to add VSTs into your DAW. But first and foremost, let's look at looping. So the idea in this video, what I want to do is I want to add extra sounds on top of this track. I want to show you guys how to identify the kind of root note of the track, how to add MIDI clips, and then how to create sounds that can work, potentially work uh, with your track tonally. So a really good technique to get this done is to find a loop in the track. So over here, you'll see at the top, Bitwig has these cycle markers and it allows you to create a loop. And over here is the loop uh, on and off arrangement loop. So what this does is it basically allows you to listen to one part kind of over and over and over again. So generally speaking, uh, in dance music, loops are made up of either bar sizes of 4, 8, 16, 32. Generally speaking, they're multiples of 4. You do get it where they do kind of shift off the grid a little bit. But that being said, is the main sections are generally bar sizes of 4, 8, 16, that kind of thing. So we could create a loop the size of 16 bars, and it'll kind of infinitely loop and kind of always sound like it's uh, kind of on groove, if that makes sense. So we can also choose whereabouts in the track we want to loop. Say, for example, we find that part a little bit boring. We can move over to like a different part of the track and like see if this is what we want to maybe work on. So anyway, if you go to vital.audio and download Vital for free and install it into the folder, which Bitwig's settings uh, plug-in location it'll automatically detect where it is but if you make sure that it's in the correct plugins folder and stuff and you install it you'll actually be able to load up vital as like a plugin inside your daw and um, so let's do that over here let's load up an instance of vital again like i said it's very visual and you get to kind of see what's going on with the screen um, here at the bottom are your filters so similar to how I was doing with the device, you kind of create the tone with this part, you shape the tone with this part, and then you add effects with this part over here. So we're gonna get into that a little bit later, but first thing I think is important is to figure out what the root note of the track is. So usually how I do this is um, I load up the instance of Vital and I play the loop of the track, and I just audition the keys. I'll start with C, then I'll go to C sharp, then I'll go to D, and I'll listen for which one sounds the most harmonious with the track that's playing. Sometimes you'll get one that's kind of like sounds all right. That will generally be the fifth of the root note. So just keep going all the way up from C to C until the one just clicks. Like you will hear it, trust me. Some people say, oh no, no, I'm tone deaf, but it's not about hearing the tone. It's almost like, especially when you've got a saw wave, there's something about, I think, the nature of the saw wave. Um, for those who don't know what a saw wave is, don't worry. It's the kind of default setting in a synthesizer. But anyway, specifically with saw waves, it kind of has this grating sound. It sounds like things are distorted and rubbing up against each other the wrong way when things are out of key. So I generally load up the default sound in Vital or Serum or whatever the plugin is that I've chosen. And I just go, again, from C to C. And you'll hear the one that's in. and Okay, so did, you hear, so did you hear that? In this particular instance, when I pressed E on my QWERTY keyboard, um, which relates to D sharp in the chromatic scale, when I pressed E, you could undoubtedly tell that was the note. It doesn't matter what the octave is. If you don't know what an octave is, I will explain a little bit later on in the video. It doesn't really matter what the octave is. You can kind of always just tell when things are harmonious and they're not that kind of grating uh, that kind of uh, very distorted effect that detuned sounds kind of create. Maybe it's just me, but I, I'm sure you can tell. If not, just keep trying and keep trying and try different parts of the track 
maybe the part of the track you've chosen has too much complex tonal elements that it's harder to figure out. Maybe shorten the loop a little bit. And yeah, again, try different parts of the track. You will get it eventually. And it's very important actually to train your ear to be able to pick that up quickly to tell like what's in key and what's out of key. This is on a very, very basic level. We're just looking for the fundamental note. So what we could potentially do is, you know, if you don't know that E on the QWERTY keyboard relates to D sharp on the chromatic keyboard, you could potentially just press play and record like this and then just hit E and you'll see that it draws the note into the MIDI clip for us, right? And now we see, okay, it's a D sharp. So that's a very easy way of being able to tell what note we're playing is what note is uh, on the chromatic scale. So that's how to record in a MIDI clip. Then what we could do is click, right click, and it opens up, if we hold right click, it opens up this menu, and then we click on the pen tool. And this allows us to actually draw in a custom MIDI clip. So I don't want to fill up the whole loop. I want to create a shorter loop that can kind of loop over the duration of the entire bar. In fact, in Bitwig and Ableton, I believe as well, if you click looping over here, this allows you to create a loop size of, let's say for example, two. And then when you drag it like this, you'll see it's got these little perforated lines. So that means that it's automatically looping that part. We could potentially draw in, uh, so you see here at the bottom, we've got what's called the piano roll. Uh, this represents notes that are being triggered in the synthesizer. And in this context, that is vital. So we could potentially draw in some D sharps over here. And I'm just going to randomly put in a pattern like this. And notice how, like if we zoom in here, if you hold control and use your mouse wheel, we zoom in here, you'll see that it's looped this MIDI pattern over and over again. So what I want to do is let's just solo this instance of Vital. So what solo means is that only this channel is going to be played. I know this is probably, uh, I know you guys probably know this, but for those who don't, solo is that, so we only going to hear the Vital channel and mute means we're not going to hear that, of course. So let's say, for example, we only want to hear this Vital that we're working on and we want to create a little loop around this rhythm. Let's solo it and let's play around a bit here. So generally speaking, I would say keep things simple. You know, for the beginning stages of your music production and sound design, keep things on the root note. Um, there's a couple of extra flourishes that you could do, which I might get into a little bit later on in the video or might save for a part two of this video. But I would say just stick with that note that we figured out, um, that D sharp, okay? However, there are other D sharps on the piano scale. For those who don't know what an octave is, an octave is basically the exact double frequency of the current frequency. So for D sharp, okay, I don't know exactly what the frequency is, but then you have what's called D sharp two, which is always harmonious with the below D sharp and vice versa, you have D sharp three, which is always harmonious. So like I said, stick to the root note, but also use the octaves when you feel like you need to. You know, that does sometimes drastically change the sound. I'm going to give you a quick example. So let's just finish putting in a rhythm over here. This is just completely random. It's probably not going to sound very musical, but we can always create something a bit more musical from it by just using uh, parameters in the synthesizer. Like I said, just experiment. You know, a lot of people are very daunted by m creating music because they feel like there's so many things to learn. But at the end of the day, so much of music is about the feeling. It's about the ear you know, feeling the groove and hearing whether it works. And that kind of stuff can't be taught in a book. It's the kind of stuff that you have to just do this over and over again until you figure out what it is that you want to hear and what knobs you have to turn to get there, if that makes sense. Okay, like I said, it's not the most musically interesting thing ever in the world, but it works. Tonally, it works. Here, let's add in a couple of octaves here and there. We can actually make this window a little bit bigger by just dragging it. So remember what I was saying about the other D sharps in on the piano scale. We can draw in some in higher registers, they call it. So higher octaves or higher registers. So here's another thing, kind of thing I want to outline is context. 
everything in music is always about context. That's the ultimate thing is context. So if we listen, if we just solo this and listen to it, it sounds very boring because we don't have the main rhythm to kind of hold everything together to kind of tell us what is on and what is off, what is it, what the actual groove is that everything is kind of fitting into. So it's very important to listen to what these things sound like with everything else, because how the sound sounds in solo doesn't really matter because it's only about the context. It's only about how it sounds with everything else because that's how everyone's gonna hear it. Solo should only be used to kind of fine tune the things and hear what's actually going on with the sound. Sometimes you may hear, for example, too much bass or too much high frequency or a particular thing that's too much in the sound. And you can solo it and find out what it is in that sound that's doing that. But it's like, again, like I said, it's all about context. Soloing the sound, it sounds very boring. It sounds like there's almost nothing going on. But in context to the rest of the track, it has a groove and it works. I mean, again, not the most, not the best musical thing ever, but it works. So we could also, uh, for example, say, say we want the entire sound to be lower frequency and deeper. We could press control A to select all of the MIDI uh, notes that we've drawn in here. And we can actually zoom like this just to make things a little bit more visual and press shift down and that tunes everything down an octave. See what happened there. So originally this note was here at D sharp one, but now we've moved everything so that it starts at D sharp zero and the second octave of notes is where the first one was. So we've kind of taken that whole pattern that we created and just shifted it one entire octave down and it's still gonna sound harmonious because everything is still on the D sharp, which is the fundamental key of the track. I wanna get into a little bit of basic sound design stuff. So I wanna look at Vital and show you guys a couple of reasons why I think this is such a powerful synth for learning purposes, but also just the fact that it's free, I think is so amazing. So what I'm gonna do is let's solo the sound. Again, like I said, it's all about context, but we're gonna fine tune the sound and figure out like what all of these parameters in Vital are doing and to be able to really know and hear that, it helps to be able to solo it. So remember this sound that we created is just the default sound. We've just loaded Vital and that's called the init preset. Most synths have what's called an init, and that's the default sound, the thing that kind of pops up when you load it. Again, let's solo this and let's play it, and I wanna show you guys a couple of things about basic synthesis. So this section over here is the oscillator section. You can have actually various oscillators loaded, put different shapes on those oscillators, and kind of stack them up in interesting patterns, and then filter that off. But just for the purpose of this video, we're gonna kind of keep things a little bit simple. And we're just gonna use a single oscillator for now. In Vital, your tuning parameters are over here. So you'll see if we hover over, it says transpose, or if you click, it says transpose. And this one is fine tune. So these parameters will actually tune the sound away from that D sharp, which we spent uh, a couple of minutes to try to figure out what it was. So I would say stick away from this parameter and this parameter, except if you really know what you're doing. If you do want to tune things down an octave, do that in the MIDI or, you know, hold shift and tune this because then it does it in octaves. But again, that's getting a little bit advanced. Try to stick away from the transpose and the tuning of the oscillators because those are gonna take things away from the harmonious nature which we created um, originally with the sound. If you do wanna create inharmonious sounds, Go for it, by all means, that's fine. But it helps to be able to understand these things before starting to break the rules and that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, we've got what's called a saw wave. Remember what I was saying earlier, the saw wave. That's this kind of init patch that you hear in most synthesizers. The reason why the saw wave is often the init is because it's the, I guess, out of all the basic shapes, it's the one with the most harmonics. Um, and it allows you to then shape those harmonics using a filter. So notice how um, when I play the sound, it sounds very bright and we put a filter on, suddenly some of that brightness comes away and we can kind of shape that brightness using different types of filters. 
it might not necessarily be brightness we could use for example a high pass filter and that will take some of the lows away and maybe make it a bit more bright so there's various different types of filters that we could use to shape the sound and i'm going to show you how to do that so over here if you en enable the filter you'll see that it's kind of given us this what looks like a frequency response here and you can actually see this frequency response is removing some of the top end and we can hear that when we audition the sound so much of dance music is built around the basic shapes kind of saw wave thing and a filter with a bit of resonance to create that bite and just the movement of these filters creates that kind of those dancey patterns and sequences yes there are way more complex things that you can do with sound design but on a very basic level the idea is to kind of find a tone and shape it with a filter and add effects and fit that into the context of the track um i guess that's a very kind of simplified way of putting it but in the end like that's that's what makes a good dance track do you see when i move this cutoff uh parameter over here that's what creates that kind of movement right we obviously don't want to sit and move this up and down with our mouse so there's various things we could use um, let's say for example call them invisible hands so it's like ways of moving parameters without actually having to physically move them so there's two different types of invisible hands in sound synthesis you have the envelope and you have the lfo so more modern synths and that kind of thing kind of the, t the lines between the two are blurred but for basic purposes an lfo is something that cycles over and over again so for example if um, i'm just going to hold a single note in vital and put an lfo on here and that's going to create a wobbling motion and then we can change the speed of that wobbling motion by changing the frequency of the lfo the other type of invisible hand that you often get is called an envelope so what an envelope is is it's basically dependent on the trigger of the midi so it only moves once every time the sound happens so let's for example add envelope 2 to the cutoff so this is another really cool thing about vital is you, everything is kind of built around this very visual drag and drop style uh, thing so you basically just take envelope 2 drag it over to the cutoff and it's it's mapped to that so now you'll see when we hit a key on our qwerty keyboard this line passes through that envelope and if we turn the sustain down here or if we just kind of do it with a mouse over here on the window you see how it creates that kind of and it holds there as long as we hold the note this kind of creates interesting rhythmical stuff when you sequence it like with this midi pattern that we've created here but my favorite is actually to use a combination of the two so we have for example this uh, envelope doing that kind of beep, 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 kind of lasery thing every time the note happens but then we want an lfo that's kind of going to do a longer sweeping motion um, that's not dependent on every time the note triggers so in the lfo what we can do is we can go over here and turn this trigger mode off we want to set this to sync so that it doesn't trigger every time the note happens and then we can drag this lfo over to the cutoff as well so here it's a little bit about fine-tuning these two values because we might not want as much lfo and as much envelope as before but let's just play around a little bit with this I also liked what was happening when I was playing with this decay setting over here on the envelope. What we can do is we can apply the same LFO onto that decay. So as the kind of frequency sweeps up, that envelope opens up a little bit as well. I think that's a really interesting kind of effect. It kind of adds more movement and build up to the pattern that you're creating. <laughs> So 
so remember, like I was saying, that one of the cool things about having these kind of external VSTs or plugins is it kind of allows you to stack everything within a single instance, like effects and everything that you need. So let's, for example, add a delay or an echo and a reverb, which are the same two kinds of effects we were using with those Bitwig devices. With the delay, I generally like to set this to ping pong and set both of these to tempo dotted and let's leave it on one over eight. And then here with a cutoff, let's just shift this up like this, just so that there's no delay happening in the low end. And then here we can move these uh, to taste, this feedback and cutoff, uh, feedback and mix, we can uh, play around with to taste. Mix, I generally don't go above like 40% and the feedback, you don't really wanna go above 70% or so. And then here with the reverb, just a little bit and maybe add an extra bit of size, that should be good. So when listening to it in context, I like the sound and it sounds nice and deep, but in context, there's already a lot of deep stuff in the track. So just adding more stuff, it doesn't really make the track sound much more fuller because that frequency range is very, already very well taken care of in the mix. So let's shift them back up an octave by selecting everything, holding control A, and then shift up, shift everything up an octave. I think that's pretty universal in almost every DAW I've ever used. So now we have we got a much higher frequency sound that's still going to be as harmonious in the track. So I also want to just explain to you quickly how automation works. And that's the ability to use invisible hands, but from within the DAW, not within the plugin. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let's say, for example, uh, this cutoff over here, we want to slowly rise this over the entire bar over here. So how we would do this is we would press this button over here, press play, and then move it. And it should now create us an automation lane here in Vital. And you'll see Vital Filter 1. And then what we can do is we can draw in our own custom curve like this over the entirety of the bar. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is talk about using the sound in a different context. So let's say, for example, remove this track and let's find a different track that we can import here. So I'm going to use another one from the album, but maybe a different key. I'm just going to mute that and let's find something here. Okay, so I've got another track here that I've just dragged onto the audio track. This track is 135 BPM. So let's just adjust this over here and let's audition a part to see if we can figure out what the key of the bass is. So I'm just going to play that part and then unmute this and we can listen to the QWERTY keys all the way up and see which one sounds the most harmonious.
So I recorded in a MIDI note. Let's just see what that was at F. So what we can potentially do is we could just move this onto the grid, right? And if we just pitch this to F, it should technically work. It should technically be harmonious. Yeah, maybe the groove won't work and we could be a little bit finicky and nitty gritty with little bits here and there. But if we make this an F, it should technically work. So let's just shift everything up by two semitones. And if we just double check, we'll see everything is on the F. Let's just zoom in. Yeah, everything is an F now or an octave of the F. And this should potentially now work. Cool, yes, for explanation purposes, that certainly does work. Um, so now I guess the idea would be like, if you wanna DJ these, you know, add these sounds into your DJ set, you could potentially just render them out as audio clips here, file, uh, export audio, and then choose the file location and stuff, and then just load them up in Tractor or whichever software you use, and then just kind of mix them in on top of the tracks. Um, it could help to render them out at various different keys. So for example, how I change from E sharp to F, you could have an F sharp, a G, and stuff that you use quite commonly and export your loops and stuff that you make in various different tempos. So if you use, for example, like 140 and 141 and 142 and various different tempos a lot, then maybe consider bouncing your loops out at various different tempos. That's certainly gonna help. But yes, that brings us to the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you do want me to carry on with this more beginner style uh, intro to music uh, production, let me know in the comments as well. So yeah, let me know what you think. Uh, let me know what other types of things I should cover in this type of topic and Yes, if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to my channel, hitting that like button and all those things. I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.